Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming. It's my great pleasure to be in one of my favourite places of the world, talking about one of my other favourite places of the world. It's, um, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to take you on a trip to Antarctica. Well, actually, I'm going to take you on two trips to Antarctica. I'm going to take you first by ship, and then I'm going to take you in by plane, for those of you that don't like travelling by ship because they're bouncy, <laughs> or because they could get stuck in the ice. So um, Antarctica, as you know, is at the very southern end of our planet, and it's an amazing continent. It's, um, it's south of everywhere. It's south of South America and the northern part of this map. It's also south of South Africa and the other northern part of this map over at 2.30, and it's also south of Australia and New Zealand. It is the southernmost part of the planet. 98% of Antarctica is covered in ice. And that equates to 5.4 million square miles that's covered in ice. And that, if it was melted, would equate to 200 feet covering the world's oceans. It's actually, on average, over a mile thick. Or to put it in context, if you put all of that ice on the lower 48, it will be one and a half miles thick. Um, the lower 48 superimposed on Antarctica. It's a big place. It's an empty place. It's probably the last nearly pristine place on Earth. Nearly pristine. There are a few scientific bases. And if you go to the right beach on the right day of the right part of summer, you'll find a few tourists. But otherwise, it's basically a pristine place. It's an entire continent that's relatively untouched by man, as I just said. 99% true wilderness. It's a, it's a continent that's so hostile that most of it is so barren that it's actually lifeless. It supports no life whatsoever. If you go to the interior of Antarctica, you'll see no evidence of life on Earth. Just think of it. That huge, vast expanse where there's no evidence of life on Earth. So why on Earth did I invite you here? <laughs> <laughs> well, on the edge of Antarctica, on the edge, the ice itself forms the beginning of a food chain that is one of the most immensely rich food, rich food chains on the planet. And I'm going to show you some of the large, visible evidence of that food chain. We're not doing a zooplankton talk here. We're going for the, uh, for the macro stuff. The birds, the mammals, the seals. Um, so, and it's a place where visitors take such great care of the place that it's almost impossible to find evidence that anyone's ever been there before you, which is fantastic. If only the rest of the planet could be like that. The typical thought when you come back from Antarctica is, boy, what a mess. You know, covered in roads, covered in buildings, <coughs> and everything else. So um, there's several ways to get to Antarctica. I'll come back to this one. It's quite, um, it's quite convenient. Um, this is where your tax dollars go, by the way, those of you who are American, and probably most folks are. Um, Ice-breaking ships like this. Um, government science programs mainly. That's one way of getting to Antarctica. But most people get to Antarctica by expedition cruise ship. This one is one that I've worked on quite often. It holds about 100 passengers. I was on it three weeks ago. I'll be back on it on Thursday. So um, I'm looking forward to going back south. Um, most people go to Antarctica from, Ush from Ushuaia, which is the southernmost town in Argentina, the southernmost town in the world probably. And it's 500 miles across the Drake Passage if you go straight there. But if you actually want a more wildlife-filled experience, you'll go via the Falkland Islands and South Georgia and then down to the Antarctic Peninsula and back across the Drake Passage. And you'll do that in about 18 or 19 days by tourist ship. And you'll travel several thousand miles in that time. And about half your time will be spent on shore and about half your time will be spent at sea. But the sea, the ocean around Antarctica, is absolutely filled with wildlife. So just a quick look at um, Ushuaia first. The Take a good look. You won't be seeing much more of this in this slideshow. Those green things? Trees. 
<laughs> Nothophagus beech trees, you get them in New Zealand as well. Gondwana land, it relates. Um, so you, you'll see those Nothophagus beech also in, on the other side of Antarctica, but not in Antarctica. Um, spectacle ducks and nostril pig meow and shimango caracara. It's full of great birds. And if you can tap a log in an appropriate way, you might even attract some Magellanic woodpeckers, which are as big as a pileated woodpecker and perhaps more dramatic, in my opinion. So you'll set sail from Ushuaia and you'll head out into the ocean and it is a, just a naturalist's heaven. There's black-browed albatrosses. Um, they don't look so big when you've got a big ocean. These things have got a five to six feet wingspan. Um, they breed around the sub-Antarctic islands and Cape petrels, another gorgeous bird of the sub-Antarctic. The old sailors used to call them Cape pigeons because they'd fly around the ship in flocks. But they're not related to the pigeon at all. They're a truly pelagic seabird. Um, White-chinned petrels. Can you see it's obvious white chin? My nickname's Chinless Wonder for this bird. It's, it's, the white chin is almost indiscernible. Um, wandering albatrosses. Wandering albatross, the bird with the largest wingspan in the world. Not the largest wings, the largest wings belongs to the soaring birds. Uh, they, they, they belong to the um, Andean condors because they soar. These are gliders, and so they've got the greatest wingspan of any bird on the planet. So they have a wingspan, that's one wing. One wing. So if someone else could stand the other side of me and be the other wing, <laughs> and you can put the body in the middle, they have an 11 to 12 feet wingspan. Um, they will fly 8,000 miles on a fishing trip to bring back food for their youngster. 8,000 miles. They'll do that, if it's windy, they'll do that at 50, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. Um, they do it even when it's not very windy. But it's often, the question is often asked, how do these birds cope on the open ocean when it's blowing a hoolie, when it's just, it's blowing 100 miles an hour? They love it. It's fine. The real question, it's the wrong question. The real question is, how do they cope when it's calm? And they cope when it's calm by sitting on the water and having a really bad time. So there's everyone on board the ship going, I wish it wasn't so rough. And there's all the albatrosses going, we're loving it. So um, grey-headed albatrosses, another lovely albatross of the Southern Ocean. Again, one of the smaller ones. And light-mantled sooty albatrosses. You see so many different albatrosses. You'll see about half a dozen different albatrosses on a trip to Antarctica. And these are one of my favourites. They are just a bit smaller than the wandering albatrosses. They've got a... Um, a wonderful, delightful habit of flying in duet, in tandem. And uh, they, they're just gorgeous. Southern formers, very much like the northern formers. They are wonderful, wonderful birds out over the ocean. Soft plumage petrels. What a weird name. And no one knows why they're called soft plumage petrels. Because they're not any softer than their congeners. They, they just figure that the person who first shot one picked it up and went, wow, that's really soft. <laughs> not as soft in the head as the person who named the black-headed gull in Europe in the, in the summer the black-headed gull has a brown head and in the winter it has a white head so let's call it black-headed gull um, and why call this one blue petrel? <laughs> who knows maybe the grey is slightly uh, bluish a slightly bluish cast who knows but um, another gorgeous bird to see from the ship as you head towards the Antarctic and of course, the ocean's filled with larger wildlife as well. Um, mammals, hourglass dolphins, named for that white pattern on their side. They're the southernmost dolphin in the world. They get right down to the edge of the Antarctic waters. And if you are very lucky indeed, you'll see a blue whale. It's, um, remember the bird with the 12 foot wingspan? It's right up there, look, on the top right of the picture. And this is just a little bit of a blue whale. Not very much of it. Um, it's very distinct 
dappled pattern on its back and its tiny little dorsal fin, which the attentive will be able to spot on the, on the far right side there of its back. Um, this is the largest mammal that ever lived on the planet. And it still lives on the planet, but no thanks to mankind, because we nearly wiped them all out. It's just incredible how many blue whales we actually obliterated from the Southern Ocean and how few have come back. Um, I've only, in, in all the years I've been going to Antarctica, every single summer, Antarctic summer since 1989, I've only ever seen blue whales in Antarctica on one day. Um, it's just such a shame. Um, the, I'll probably choose some sub-Antarctic islands. So let's go to the Falkland Islands, which aren't really true sub-Antarctic islands, but um, they are a great stopover for a couple of days on your way to Antarctica, and you can see an awful lot of wildlife by uh, going ashore. And, of course, I feel right at home there. <laughs> it's, um, I, even get to I even get to spend pounds, and I, um, and I get to drink English tea and all sorts. But um, on the cliffs on the Falkland Islands, on the windy cliffs, black-browed albatrosses nest. And you can see why they're called black-browed albatrosses. Every single black-browed albatross has a slightly different marking on its head. And they are just gorgeous. They are just absolutely gorgeous. Again, these are very large birds. They've got huge beaks for eating squid. And they have elaborate courtship displays. They have very ritualistic courtship displays. So here's a couple. Um, just indulging in some uh, necking, if we could use that word. And, um, and, uh, and they're, they're beaking, yes, indeed. So it's just quite the show. It's quite the show. I felt like quite the voyeur <laughs> taking these photographs. So, yeah. Yeah, amazing birds. Black-browed albatrosses. So they build these mud domes, a bit like flamingos build, little mud domes, and, and the babies... Um, I just don't look like they're ever going to fly anywhere. <laughs> Is this bird really going to cruise the world oceans? You know, it's, um, but, um, you know, as, as are most babies, it's got some vestigial wings, look, they're, they're black on the side there, and it will demand food, and, um, or at least attention, you know, and, um, and they get attention, but it's pretty, I mean, how do you preen something when you've got a beak this big? You know, that's a, that's a loving caress from a uh, parent black-browed albatross. So, and also, alongside the black-browed albatrosses, there's rockhopper penguins. And um, they're quite extraordinary <laughs> birds, too. They, um, they have the, the most amazing... Um, <coughs> the most amazing heads. <coughs> so, if anyone's inspired, get your gel out and uh, go home and just do a bit of, bit of this, and uh, you could be a rockhopper penguin. Um, and, you know, stay up all night and you'll get the red eye too. <laughs> and then there's raptors. The, uh, the striated caracaras are very inquisitive. They were very common in southern South America, but they were too inquisitive for their own good. And, and mankind didn't do them any favours. But here on the Falklands, um, they will come right up to you and they'll, they'll try and pick your pocket, literally. It's, it's extraordinary. Um, Magellanic penguins are all over the Falkland Islands. You don't see them in Antarctica, you see them in sub-Antarctic, and they're burrow nesters. So they nest in lovely habitat like this, where the sheep haven't grazed off, or the, and a lot of Falkland's been overgrazed. But um, in the areas where it's not been overgrazed, you get the um, lovely grasses there, and the penguins nest in amongst the grass. So they actually, and here's a youngster, the one on the uh, right of your view there is a, is a young Magellanic penguin, and they gather together in huge, great flocks at the end of summer to molt. And penguins do what they call a catastrophic molt. They molt all of their feathers in one continuous, quick go. So they starve for a few weeks. It's a crash diet, completely a crash diet. They lose half their body weight, maybe. And they will change every single feather on their body so they're capable to spend the entire winter at sea. There's Magellanic snipe, very much like our Wilson snipe here. And if you go to the Falklands and you go on a tourist ship, you'll visit an island such as West Point Island, where we've just been, where it's a single family homestead. 
and of course, in true British style, we'll invite you in. That's all of you. Um, about 100 people. Fortunately, there's a lot to look at outside, so you don't wind up all going in at once. But um, you go in for tea and cakes, bone china, proper, proper bone china. Um, and then uh, Lily and Roddy Napier are on the right of the picture here. They're the own owners of this island. They no longer live on the island, though. It's, um, they had to go into Port Stanley to shop, which is a long flight. And they figured that eventually it was just worth staying in Port Stanley and, and not, um, not flying back every time they had to go shopping. So they now don't live on the island at all. There's kelp geese on the beaches. And there's upland geese above the beaches. And the Falklands don't get very high, so... Upland geese just means they're not on the beach, basically. Um, and ruddy-headed geese. And uh, the upland geese uh, are quite dramatic, and they're very good to eat, apparently. But I've never eaten one. And there's a famous hotel in Port Stanley called the Upland Goose. But the, uh, the female's on the right, and the male's on the left there, the, the paler one. And this is Port Stanley, the capital of the Falklands. Quintessentially British in places. The... This building houses the Falkland Conservation Trust in the left-hand end of that row of buildings there. So if you're on the Falklands and you want to support the Falklands Conservation Trust, there's a great place to go and do your shopping, to buy your souvenirs. Um, and then there's Stanley Cathedral. Look at the size of those whale bones. That's a whalebone arch. They're blue whale bones. Can you imagine how big the mammal was that had those bones? And... Uh, not many people live on the Falklands, but they're um, pretty environmentally clued up. And this is just in a private garden, a private yard. There's someone who's managed to put together some whale bones, and they've got a harpoon. And let me tell you a bit about the harpoon, as you can see. It's a very sad reminder of uh, what we did 100 years or more ago. In fact, not even that long ago, shore-based whaling was still going on into the 1960s. Um, I like his beard. <laughs> he, grew up in, he grew up in the Isles of Scilly and moved to the Falklands. Um, the Argentinians left some mines behind and didn't map where they put them. So a lot of the area around Port Stanley, you can no longer walk around. No one has any accidents. They just put up barbed wire fences and they figured that those areas were going to be out of bounds. It's, it's a shame. And there's other places that are quite difficult to walk to because of the geological formations known as rock runs. Um, and you can't drive a vehicle over that, and you can't walk over it. It's just incredible. It's like a scree slope on the level. <laughs> Dolphin gulls, a beautiful gull of the Falklands and southern South America, and rufous-chested dotterels. Oh, my word, they're just gorgeous. If you were a Falklander before the shops came, this is what you made jam from. It's quite bitter. It's diddle D. makes gorgeous jam, though. So it's um, as you to the Falklands, and we're off to South Georgia now. And South Georgia's two days sailing by ship, so lots more whales and seabirds, and hopefully some calm weather. But you don't want it too calm, because when it gets too calm and you start crossing into Antarctic waters, you need to keep an eye out for icebergs. But fortunately, they show up on the ship's radar readily. And uh, meanwhile, of course, while the navigation officers are looking for the icebergs, and you're maybe photographing them, there's Cape petrels to be seen on the water and a, a lot of other birds, which I show you a few of already. And we'll never get to Antarctica if I don't keep going. Um, I showed you the lower 48 earlier to give you the scale of Antarctica. Um, here's London for comparison. There's Heathrow on the uh, west side of London, look, and Barking over on the east side. Um, South Georgia, this sub-Antarctic island, it's, um, as you can tell, this is a satellite picture of it. It's, the island itself is about 100 miles long, about 20 miles across. It's covered in snow and ice in the winter, but it has permanent ice fields in the summer and glaciers that reach the ocean. And it's the most extraordinary place because it's surrounded by this ocean full of, full of food. And here's an aerial view of, of South Georgia. And the ocean full of food provides the wildlife that gathers on the beaches and the lower parts of the island in huge numbers. I mean, on this beach here, you can see Antarctic fur seals, king penguins, gentoo penguins, el southern elephant seals. It's just absolutely filled with wildlife. It's just extraordinary. It's, it's, it's paradise. Every, this particular beach is called Gold Harbour. 
And every time I go there, and I go there almost every time I visit South Georgia, I walk less and less and less because I find it even more inspiring the more I go there. And I just have to sit down and look at it and photograph it. So um, the elephant seals are perhaps sparring, or, or uh, these are the bull elephant seals. If you think those penguins are big, and they are, they're three feet tall, the elephant seals are significantly bigger, as you can see. And um, they're just uh, sparring. This isn't in, in earnest. The, uh, the breeding season was earlier. So um, I often describe elephant seals as visible bad breath, by the way. So I won't, I won't give you the view straight down the throat. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, here they, they, they're all ashore in the summer to molt. And they have a very hard time of it molting. They're lying out in the southern sun. And so they have to actually cover themselves up with gravel off the beach. Fur seals are very common there too, and the beaches are absolutely full of fur seals, which is great because when I first started going in 89, there were very, very, very few fur seals in South Georgia, but they've really bounced back. We hunted them almost to extinction way back. In the uh, early part of the 20th century, they were nearly extinct. And they managed to bounce back, and now there's millions of them absolutely millions of them on South Georgia. So much so that the, uh, the southern giant petrels that also bred a scavenging bird that's the size of an albatross manages to, uh, to find a pup fur seal uh, dead in the water or maybe they've even killed it and managed to devour the, uh, the fur seal pup. So life goes on. And as you can see, it's, it's just such a dramatic place. And you can't quite appreciate yet, but this is a zodiac going ashore, and this zodiac is going ashore at a place we're following the king penguins in, because this is a place where king penguins nest in their large numbers, very large numbers. And where the king penguins go ashore is a great place to go ashore. You'll get met by a welcoming committee, <laughs> and the welcoming committee are actually at least as interested in you as you are in them, but of course they don't carry cameras. And it's, it's heaven. It's heaven on earth. How can you not want to go back there? Um, it's just spectacular. The place is so overwhelmed with this. This one place, um, Salisbury Plain, there's a quarter of a million king penguins there. And they just, if this was a panoramic shot, they'd be going way out into the yard that way and way out through into the reception area that way. Um, it's just extraordinary. So, very stately. So I say the second largest penguin. And there's a youngster just a few days old, just, just hatched out of its egg. Um, yet by 12 months' time, it'll be bigger than mum and dad, put together probably. They, they, they just get absolutely huge because eventually they have to molt all those lovely downy feathers, which are keeping them warm, into swimming feathers to go to sea in. And so when they get to about this size, eventually the parents will stop feeding them and eventually they'll molt. So, you know, when you get thrown out of home, you won't have to molt. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully you won't look anything like that. <laughs> Yeah, just, just extraordinary. So there's also macaroni penguins on South Georgia. There's millions of macaroni penguins on South Georgia, but they, they nest in the most rocky and inconvenient places to get to. So frequently they're, they're difficult to photograph. But uh, here we have... Um, they look very similar to the rock hopper penguins of the Falklands, but the, uh, the arrangement of the yellow on their heads slightly different and the orange on their gapes different as well. So... Uh, you know, if you take a good guide, you'll be able to spot the difference. Um, Black-throated finches, um, another nice bird. And Antarctic terns. Unlike the Arctic terns, which migrate all the way to Antarctica, Antarctic terns don't migrate so far back. And light-mantled sooty albatrosses come ashore to nest. And these light-mantles um, are displaying, look, on top of this cliff high above the, uh, above the sea. And um, uh, there am I perched in the behind the camera taking a photograph of them, probably about 200 feet above the sea there. And they sit up, they nest up on these ledges, 
and they'll fly by very close and give you gorgeous views, absolutely gorgeous views. So and they have this lovely whaling call as well. Whaling used to go on at South Georgia, and the whaling stations are now historical artefacts. That's the way of the world these days. If it's, I mean, you know, I don't, I'm not preaching to the converted here. If it's older than 20 years old, it's an antique, isn't it? Um, so um, the whaling stations, most of you have probably heard of Sir Ernest Shackleton, who tried to do an overland crossing, the first ever overland crossing of Antarctica. He took a wooden ship into the Weddell Sea. He got it stuck in the ice. He spent the entire winter on the ice. They eventually took, the, the ship got crushed. They took three lifeboats. They dragged the lifeboats across the ice. The, um, the current brought them back up to the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. They put into the lifeboats. They rowed to, South jo uh, to um, Elephant Island. From Elephant Island, they got off. They realized there was no hope of rescue there. So um, just a small party with Shackleton on board took one of the lifeboats. They took it with the prevailing wind and currents 800 miles across the Southern Ocean to reach South Georgia. They then had to cross South Georgia, 10,000 feet high. They had to cross South Georgia. They didn't even have a map. They got down to the coast. It was the wrong damn cove. <laughs> they then had to go back up over to the next cove because they heard the steam whistle at this whaling station announcing lunch break. And they heard it and they realized they were saved. But that was just the people on the boat. They then had to go back to South America, raise some money, and put a rescue ship together, to, a rescue party together, to go back to Elephant Island and, um, and, and pick the others up. So um, some good came of the whaling station, um, because they would never have been rescued otherwise. So um, this is Gritvik and Whaling Station, and this is where Sir Anna Shackleton's buried. And if you look at the graveyard here, um, Sir Ernest Shackleton's grave is the one that everyone's gathered around and they're toasting to the boss, uh, as he is known. Every other grave in that graveyard is traditionally facing east. Uh, his grave is facing south. It's actually his head's facing Antarctica. And when he died, he died on another Antarctic expedition. They let his wife know back in the UK, and she said, bury him down there. He loved Antarctica more than me. <laughs> so <laughs> there he is. Oh, there he is, buried at least. So um, the Norwegians, when they had this whaling station there, built a church, and it's um, completely empty these days, of course. But it's worth going into the church and saying something, because um, South Georgia needs help. And quick commercial break here, I'm afraid. Um, South Georgia is a place where whalers and sealers accidentally introduced rats. And half of South Georgia has got rats on it, and the other half of South Georgia hasn't. And as the glaciers are going to retreat, all of South Georgia will wind up with rats on it. And as we all know, rats are absolutely the end of ground nesting birds. Well, I've told you how many trees there are in South Georgia. So everything nests either on the ground or underground. So everything that nests there is susceptible to predation by rats. There's millions and millions and millions of seabirds there. But it's estimated that by getting rid of the rats, there could be an extra 100 million seabirds breeding on South Georgia. Um, we got rid of all the whales, so we know there's plenty of food for the birds to feed on. That's, that's not going to sound like a positive note, but um, uh, it is a positive note. There is lots of food off South Georgia, and the idea is, and it's an ongoing operation, is to actually rid South Georgia of the rats. So when the glaciers retreat, and even before the glaciers retreat, Instead of having rats affect the remaining nesting seabirds, it's the other way around. The remaining nesting seabirds can move back in to the areas that they formerly occupied. So um, how do you do it? It's like you want to eradicate the rats without eradicating the breeding birds and things. Well, actually, it's fairly straightforward. And there's some great things to avoid eradicating here, by the way, as we already know, and there's some more of them. The South Georgia pipit, the Antarctic prion, and this is a nesting southern, it's a southern giant petrel chick, and uh, the Wilson storm petrel. The real answer to the pub quiz question, what's the most widespread bird in the world? This bird's nests and feeds all over the world's oceans, and in huge numbers in South Georgia, but its eggs and chicks are getting eaten by rats. So um, by spreading rat bait by helicopter, 
at the end of the breeding season, the birds won't get affected. The land mammals, native land mammals, well, there aren't any, so they don't get affected. The only thing that's going to get affected, pretty much, are the rats. And it's already been half done. Half of South Georgia has already been done. It's the biggest rat eradication project the world has ever undertaken anywhere by a factor of about 100. It's huge. It's a very, very ambitious project, but it's very, very cost effective. The whole thing's only costing about $12 million, but they still need another $5 million. So no one's allowed to leave this evening <laughs> until you've contributed <laughs> your share of that $5 million, OK? Um, so yeah, the, um, this is how they do it. They put rat poison in fertilizer spreaders. They take them from helicopters. They do helicopters transex with GPS to make sure they don't miss anything. And they do every area between the glaciers one by one by one. Half of it's been done, and, um, and the other half is, uh, those are the areas that they need doing. You'll notice they're all on the east or the northern coasts. The southern coast is just lashed by the southern gales by the, um, by the Antarctic weather. And so man never went there. So this is, um, it's, you know, this is a map of where rats are on South Georgia. It's a map of where man's been on South Georgia. It's a map of um, where we've had a huge impact and where we're hoping that we can actually, and we will, it will work. The, um, the monitoring has proven that it will work. So, yeah, it's fantastic. This is taken from a helicopter about two or three or 4,000 feet above the Gritvik and Wading Station, look, and King Edward Point. So, afterwards you can ask me or my wife Denise, who's actually heading up the US non-profit for this, as to how you might be able to help if you wish to. Meanwhile, it's nice weather on an early, early winter's day in South Georgia, late summer, the helicopters are uh, just waiting for some fuel or something to fly. Um, let's head to sea and head towards Antarctica itself. And uh, the other thing that you pray for in the church is good weather, because it's not always good weather. <laughs> and this is a day when it was a good day to hide behind an iceberg. I got up that morning, and it was like, I thought we were going ashore this morning. And you took one look outside the ship, and you knew damn well that you were going nowhere this morning. And the captain was on the bridge, just hiding behind. That iceberg's about 70 or 80 feet high. You can just see the mountains of South Georgia behind it. And the wind's blowing about 70 miles an hour, continuous. And... Uh, you weren't allowed out on the deck. You, at, if you wanted to get a clear view, you opened someone's cabin window, and preferably not yours. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was a windy day. They come and they go, and, um, and so do you. You move on. And eventually the seas calm down, and then you get to start seeing some Antarctic icebergs. And remember that 85% of that iceberg is underwater. That iceberg's probably 100 feet high that you can see. Yeah, do the math. It's not a mile deep, it's not, but it's pretty darn deep indeed. So they come in all shapes and sizes. They break off the continent. They break off glaciers. And when they finally break up into tiny little pieces, they might be gathered up on the current in bits of brash ice like this. And then, finally, you reach Antarctica itself. And what can you say? <laughs> the pictures don't do Antarctica justice. They really, really don't. The, those mountains in the background are a few hundred feet high in the rest. Those mountains in the background of that picture are, I think, uh, 8,000 feet high. It's Anvers Island. The highest peak on Anvers Island is over 9,000 feet. I think it's just hidden in the clouds just on the left side of the picture there. Um, the ice cliffs at the bottom are hundreds of feet high. The place is just so buried in ice, it's unimaginable. There's a huge glacier flowing down this in the middle, look. And then there's, there's birds that mirror the beauty of Antarctica, in my opinion. The snow petrels. Snow petrels live there year-round. They survive the Antarctic winter on the edge of the Antarctic continent, on the edge of the Antarctic ice. And think about it. It's pitch black. It's probably, I don't know how many degrees below freezing. 
how many degrees below zero. And these birds still have to find food. So they smell. They find their food partially by smell. And so the snow petrel has the largest olfactory lobe of any bird on the planet by ratio because it survives the Antarctic winter and uh, never heads north. So um, getting out and getting up close to the wildlife is the aim of any Antarctic trip and you can get really close to all sorts of things because they have no fear of man. It should be the other way around actually in the case of a leopard seal. This thing's nine feet long, it's nearly a thousand pounds. <laughs> it eats penguins like they were snack bars or penguins. <laughs> <laughs> penguin bars from the UK um, and um, when they're full they just lie around on the ice floes and dream about their last meal perhaps <laughs> and, 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 and they look so, have such a benign smile but that head is that long it's, you know, they, they're just immense and they, they catch a penguin they just shake it they shake it out of its own skin um, and then they swallow it whole, maybe. Yeah. Crab-eater seals. Crab-eater seals um, don't eat crabs. Another great name. <laughs> crab-eater seals eat krill, actually. But if you look at this crab-eater seal, look on its flanks. It's got the scars. Every single crab-eater seal that you see, 99.9% .9 of them, have got scars on their flanks. And that's not where the crabs have fought back. It's actually, almost certainly, from where it nearly got eaten, by a leopard seal when it was small. And the way they escape is they barrel roll. Can you imagine having teeth in your side and then you barrel roll out? <laughs> well, you're going to wind up with scars looking like that. So, you know, you'll be in Aspen Valley before you know it if you try it. So, um, yeah, crab eater seals. Um, not all of Antarctica is covered in ice. Some of it's volcanic, some of it's north-facing and volcanic, and the ice just doesn't quite cover everything. This is a place known as Brown Bluff, uh, for obvious reasons. And right at the bottom of Brown Bluff, you find lots of penguins, because they can get ashore there easily. And offshore, just in the inshore waters, it's a great place in summer, late summer especially, to find whales. Humpback whales come all the way from the coastal parts of, southern, of middle South America, even Brazil, that far north, they come down to Antarctica to feed. So you can imagine, they're swimming in the summer, in the tropics, and then they go to these waters here, which are about 36 degrees, and they, they come down here for the fantastic food opportunities, the fantastic feeding opportunities that, that Antarctica offers. And there's projects, every single humpback whale has a unique pattern underneath its tail. Just like every single human being has a unique fingerprint, every single humpback whale has a completely individual patterning on the underside of its tail. And there's people doing science on these. If you take a photograph of a humpback whale, you can submit that and they'll put it in their database and they'll probably be able to tell you where it's been and when, just based on other people's photographs. Great example of citizen science. I don't know where that one was before. And and this is a really interesting whale you get down there as well, southern bottlenosed whale. It's a deep diving, little known whale. And all those marks on the side of its body are scars. They're scars from fighting with other male southern bottlenosed whales. So this is a male southern bottlenosed whale. They dive to the deepest parts of the ocean. They dive several thousand feet deep and they fight and make a mess of themselves. But there we go. <laughs> um, and then onshore, the Gen 2 penguins. This is early summer. They are waiting for the snow to melt. And they are going to build their nests on the first place the snow melts, which is often up the hill somewhere, on the ridge line, where the wind scours the snow away and exposes the first rocks. And they build nests with little pebbles in order that as they get snowed upon and as they keep their egg warm, that the water that's created from melting snow drains away through the pebble nest. So here's a pair displaying, and the one on the right is on its nest, on its lovely little pile of pebbles. It's probably the female, 
and the mail's just come back and it's giving a greeting display and it may well already be on two eggs and they, they incubate their eggs very quietly. They just sit there and, um, and they, they uh, will eventually uh, just doze off and someone will come along and steal pebbles or, or even boulders. I mean, <laughs> what was he thinking? Or she? You know, it's building a nest with that. I mean, is this, is this a project to try and rebuild the Twin Towers or something? It's just, like, it's just incredible. So, and this penguin's gone to sleep on the right look, and there's someone coming in to steal um, some of the nest. So, yeah, snooze, you lose. You'll lose your nest if you go to sleep. Um, and then, like most of these seabirds down here, they feed their youngsters by regurgitation. And it, they have to race. The, the Gen 2 penguins that nest in Antarctica from the time their eggs hatch, and it takes them about five weeks to hatch their eggs, from the time their eggs hatch until the time the babies are ready to go to sea, it has to be before winter. They do it, they manage to get their babies out to sea in as little as 62 days. As little as 62 days. On the Falklands, they can take up to 120 days to do the same thing because it's warm, there's no, Im there's no imperative of the ice coming in. Um, they're inquisitive, <laughs> very inquisitive, <laughs> extremely inquisitive. <laughs> Another beautiful penguin down there is the chinstrap penguin, and uh, obviously named. Um, another brush tail penguin, and they are raucous. A colony of chinstrap penguins will deafen you, <laughs> completely deafen you. They are just so damn noisy. Um, are daily penguins. You know, of the 18 species of penguin in the world, only two are endemic to Antarctica. A daily penguin's one of them, an emperor penguin is the other. And I'm going to uh, move things along now a little bit. This is a daily penguin coming out of the water. And here's a daily penguin pleased that he got out of the water. And sometimes you wonder if you're looking at them <laughs> or they're looking at you. Just what are you? <laughs> Just what are you? You're not a damn penguin, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, daily penguins, because they're an Antarctic penguin, um, get their babies off even quicker, 42 days. They feed them up to a certain weight and they just wave goodbye. Like, you're big enough now, you can get rid of your down yourself, you can molt, and this bird's halfway through its molt, look. And, um, and then you can go to sea. And when it comes to looking after yourself, yeah, look after yourself. Here's a skewer. Um, the, the skewers in Antarctica feed on penguin chicks, penguin eggs, um, and, and other things. And uh, this penguin's having to look after itself, faced by this skewer. And it's, a, it's a story that ended well. It saw the skewer off. Um, another predator in Antarctica are the snowy sheath bills the only non-web-footed bird in Antarctica, uh, as it's amply demonstrating for us there. Uh, they migrate all the way from South America <coughs> every year to keep the penguin colonies honest. Now, they are trash disposal at the penguin colonies. They will clean up everything and everything. I won't go into detail. Um, yeah, they're amazing. And um, Sheathbill, well, they've got a very basic sheath bill. So yeah, there's other things to do in Antarctica, like go climb a rock and pose for a camera. But, um, well eventually, it's time to uh, take more scenery photographs because it is so incredibly scenic, unbelievably scenic. And of course, the icebergs, I mean, how on earth did those get made? Incredible. And eventually, um, you set off back towards Ushuaia, you've got two days at sea to look forward to. You say goodbye to the icebergs pretty, pretty quickly. Um, there's Cape Petrels just feeding around the interface of the ice and the water there around this. And um, maybe you'll have a barbecue before you set off. Um, and now I'm going to take you on a very quick trip to Antarctica. I'm going to take you by plane. And I'm going to just whiz through the logistics slides of this bit. So um, this, is what, this is how you travel. 
It's, um, this, is, this is, you're on about a mile and a half thick of ice when you've landed in Antarctica. And uh, the jet comes in, it's a wheeled Russian jet. It's about the size of a Boeing 767. And, um, but there's no gate facilities when you get there. <laughs> That's the navigator's bubble behind. That's base camp and a couple of aircraft from Canada. Uh, if you want to lift, I'll give you a ride on the snowmobile and get up to camp. It's, that's the middle of the night, by the way. You're at 80 degrees south at base camp. And it's pretty cold there. That negative 10, zero Fahrenheit. So if you want to drink at night, you'll have a thermos flask in your tent. And you also will have a pee bottle in your tent because going to the loo in the middle of the night is a pretty lonely trip. <laughs> uh, daytime in the food tent, it's warm and comfortable. People go and hike to the South Pole from there. It takes them two months. They're crazy. <laughs> There's nothing more I can say. They're just damn crazy. Remember, between there and the South Pole, how much wildlife are they going to see? the only evidence of life on planet Earth that they're going to see, they're actually towing in that sled behind them or is in their pockets. Um, yeah. So they're the um, aircraft from Canada that come down to do the ferry flights out. Oops, a uh, snowcat. We're going off for a picnic on the edge of the runway. And look at the glacial erratics on the runway there. And that's the aircraft out to the penguins, the skier crypt aircraft. And... When you go out to the penguin, you make sure you take lots of food, lots of everything, and then the pilot complains that the aircraft is actually overloaded. <laughs> How much extra food did you bring? How much extra sleeping, warm weather gear did you bring? And we're flying out from base camp about 400 miles to the coast for the Emperor Penguins. And the range of the aircraft is actually slightly less than 400 miles. Fortunately, the ferry flight fuel out to a bamboo pole, which may know where the bamboo pole is. And when you find the bamboo pole, you can find some fuel and refuel and carry on. Um, the 360 degree view is the same all the way around. It's in the background there. That's the, that's the view. So you, GPS is a wonderful thing. I mean, we always find gas stations by using the GPS, right? So um, this is the Southern Weddell Sea, and you can probably see why Shackleton didn't make it. This is um, monstrous great ice flows and huge great icebergs trapped in ice that's attached to the continent. This is Antarctica on the very, very bottom left of this slide. That is all in the foreground is all sea ice with icebergs trapped in it. And the emperor penguins know where that ice will stay summer round so they can find their babies when they've gone out to sea and come back to feed them. And so what you're looking for and what the emperor penguins are looking for initially is sea ice that's going to stay there all summer. And out in the distance, or in fact not so far distance on this particular trip, because I've done this trip several times, um, the edge of the, so to speak, broken ice is very close to the penguins because if you look here, those brown stains between the icebergs are the emperor penguins that we've come to see. So at this point, the pilot's circling around going, you want me to land down there? And I'm going, yep. And he's looking at it again and he goes around again and goes, down there? And yeah, absolutely, it's what these guys do for a, for a living. They're bush pilots and they fly in the Arctic all summer. And we eventually landed about there and we taxied out over here and we actually wound up camping down there. And we were about a kilometre, nearly just over half a mile from the penguins, put the aircraft down, got the tents up in case the wind got up and basically set the, uh, the cook tent up and your own tents and this is the view out of my own tent window. And if you look very carefully, had I cleaned the window, there's two ghosts outside. 
the emperor penguins have come over to find us. And the camp is surrounded by inquisitive penguins, wondering who their six-foot massive penguins are that have come to visit them. And the views the other way, that's an iceberg. That's when you know you're out at sea because you know that 85% more is underwater and that it's probably grounded, but, but hey, that's a lot of water underneath you. So um, the views are just extraordinary. It's, it's, it's a mind-boggling experience. And even here, there's other birds come to prey on the emperor penguins. Here's a skewer, a south polar skewer. Come looking for penguin eggs. It's a bit late for those now. It's looking for um, small, very tiny baby penguins. This one's well grown. The, um, the baby penguins, when they're first born, are obviously very small and very susceptible to predation by skewers. But what they're looking for is, is baby penguins that have died in the last blizzard, the last spring snowstorm. And they're also looking for spilt food. So here's a baby penguin that's very young. And I hate to say it, but it's too young compared to all the other ones, and it almost certainly won't make it through to the end of summer when the other ones will all be molting and getting their adult coats. This one will probably be too small. But um, here's a great big tabular iceberg in the background. Lots of um, adult emperor penguins and lots of babies too. And, of course, as we know, they have to go to sea to feed. So they like to toboggan. It's a much more efficient way of travel. As anyone under 10 can tell you. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's very, very efficient indeed. You just get your belly down, you get your, your keel on the ice, and with just a tiny little flick of those toes, they'll manage to scooch along at a really good speed. You can't keep up with them. You'd need a, a snowmobile or something to actually keep up with them. They're, they're very darn quick. But when the, when the going gets tough and you get pressure ridges in the sea ice where you've got a crack in the ice and it's come back together again, they actually have to walk. And I always think this lot look like they just walked out of um, the Bronx or somewhere. <laughs> I usually say the East End if I'm talking to an English audience. But, um, they, they, they just look like they mean business. <laughs> <laughs> and so they get to the edge of the water and... Actually, the water's just frozen, which isn't a very good thing because it was a cold night. But that's not why they're waiting. In the water, of course, are leopard seals. So you go first. <laughs> no, no, no. After you, please. They're, they're, they're frightfully British about it. <laughs> please, after you. The leopard seal's waiting for you, for sure. And I, I think that what actually happens is, is that Eventually, someone just nudges one of them into the water, and then they all go piling in, going, someone's in, we'll go. But when you get right to the end of the line, we well, don't want to be last either. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, um, it's looking a bit like I'm last. And so you never see the whole line of penguins go into the water. It's quite extraordinary. So they get out, and they have a bathe in the, um, in the open water. You can see it's filled with ice little tiny bits of ice that are, are, are floating around there. And they have a bit of a bathe. And then they either go off to feed or they come back onto the ice. So you're sitting here. And remember how much water there is underneath. And you're just hoping the ice doesn't break off while you're taking all of these pictures. And the penguins just come flying out of the water. It's the closest they get to flying. And they don't do a very good job of it. And they soon land. But as they come out, they're covered in water. And... They just look all shiny and glistening, almost oily. And then they have to dry off and then go back and, and find their youngsters. So they'll, um, they'll probably sit down for a bit. But they come flying out of the water. Do some funky dance. And then they have to go back and find their baby. And it'll be anywhere because the adult's been away and the babies just go wandering around and they hang out with other babies. And remember, each penguin's only got one baby. And, you know, like, where's mum? I don't know. I mean, what do they talk about? I don't know. They probably are. Have you got an Xbox yet? Yeah. Um, and when the, when the wind gets cold, they huddle. 
and but they're listening all the time they find their youngsters they find their parents by sound every i mean it's so damn noisy there it's untrue every single emperor penguin knows the sound of its own parents or the sound of its chick and so when they hear penguins coming back everyone wakes up and go oh, where, 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 where? that was my mum i'm sure it was i swear it was i swear it was food coming back and the uh, the adult penguins are standing around calling trying to find their youngsters they bow their heads and call and they make a heck of a noise doing it and eventually baby finds parents and parents find baby so um and then there's begging it's like you are my mum you're my mum feed me feed me feed me feed me please feed me and so it's very noisy still and then eventually the other uh, parents manage to retch up a meal and it's feeding time now these are the deepest diving birds in the world they dive to 2,000 feet and if you dive to 2,000 feet and you catch a fish you don't want to damn lose it so look at the barbs on the tongue not only the tongue of the adult but baby's already got barbs on its tongue as well and on the sides of its mouth so um, yeah you don't get to see the gory action the head goes right inside and um, the rest is uh, the rest is um, yeah it's a tiring business time to go to sleep get your head under your wing and one contented baby and a and some other ones that are still looking for food so I'll take you through a few more photographs of uh, emperor penguins chicks on feet a tiny tiny chick this one and there's that's home when you're a baby emperor penguin look at that 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 is just ideal that's where you go and climb onto and then you get snuggled right up just like that <laughs> just ideal perfect yeah and if you don't know how to do that well you're just not an emperor penguin um, and every time the wind blows someone doesn't make it it's, uh, it's a tragic end but 90% of emperor penguin chicks don't make it to a year old so when you get a ground blizzard in the early summer everyone just hunkers down and um, when everyone gets back up again well actually not everyone does get back up again and you get visitors remember the adelie penguins we saw them on the coast adelie penguins the other endemic antarctic penguin um, but like the ones the other ones that nest on the coast they build nests of stones and we're out on the sea ice here so the best they can do is make a nest of snowballs a nest of snowballs <laughs> excuse me <laughs> what were you thinking but then again with a head shape like that maybe i shouldn't ask so um yeah you don't get too close to the icebergs because where they roll around you get great big um little valleys close to the iceberg and, and you can slip down in there and it's the open ocean below so from a safety point of view you stick away and the icebergs come in all fantastic shapes just incredible and um, a few arty shots for you quite the threesome What a place to live. I swear he was a hitchhiker. <laughs> I absolutely swear it. But he didn't get a ride. Left him behind. And it's the end of our uh, Antarctic trip, or both Antarctic trips. So, you know, if you want to know anything more about getting to Antarctica, just I'll be pleased to uh, take any questions. Um, if you want to know anything more about getting to Antarctica, there's a sign-up sheet outside you can just leave you leave your contact details and i'll get in touch with you or my wife will get in touch with you about how uh, tourists can get to antarctica it's actually very straightforward it's um and it's not even very cold only in the interior of antarctica is it cold the flying trips are actually quite expensive but the um the trips to the coast if you're a sailor and even if you're not 
it's actually quite easy. But it's an amazing place. It's one of my favourite, favourite, favourite places, along with this area and a few others. If you don't find me here, you'll find me in the Arctic. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Okay, I'll just pass you a microphone because we. Uh, what are you noticing about the uh, ice, about the glaciers melting and the receding? So, ice? so the question was, um, what do I notice or what have I noticed about the uh, the glaciers receding, and the melting ice? Um, when I, I've been going for 24 years now, but there's so much ice there that one doesn't actually notice too much in terms of. And especially because it's a maritime climate on the coast, you get different weather every day. Every day looks different. But the one thing that's exceptionally obvious when you go there for this amount of time is the Adelie penguins, which are an Antarctic penguin, are retreating south. The Gen 2 penguins, which are a sub-Antarctic penguin, are moving in from the north. And... That's a very obvious change that I've noticed just through casual observation. The worry, the concern is, is that the sea ice production upon which the whole food chain depends may collapse and the whole food chain would collapse from it. So although um, there will still be lots of ice in Antarctica, and in actual fact with the melting ice from the continent, there's more fresh water around the coasts probably and with more fresh water around the coast in the short term that freezes more readily and you get more extent of sea ice in the short term who knows where that's all going long term it's um it's interesting times we live in yeah any more questions yes, can i pass you the um, microphone yeah. uh, just in, in terms of uh, of the fishing that's going on there commercial fishing is that having an impact on you know the wildlife around there so the question was, is commercial fishing having an impact on the, on the wildlife? Um, it almost certainly is. Show me a fishery that, that never impacted the wildlife. And, and not only is there fishing in Antarctica, but of course there's actually whaling in Antarctica as well. Um, scientific whaling, the Japanese call it. And all of these things will be having an impact. And because it's very hard to police the world's oceans, there are policed fisheries, and then there are the open oceans where there is no uh, looking after, there's no policing of the ocean. So yes, certainly there is impact. Um, the Australians and the New Zealanders look after their sector fairly closely. And in fact, I might call my wife in to um, Denise. Did everyone catch that? There is, there is regulation, yeah. but um, I remain sceptical that yeah, it's, good. it's good. Do we have any other questions? Up the front here. Thank you. South Georgia. What's the history of those rats? How long have they been there? Or have they always been there? Or? Yeah, the, the history of the rats on South Georgia. How long have they been there? Have they always been there? Uh, the rats were brought accidentally to South Georgia by the sealers and the whalers. So they were brought in the 19th century, accidentally, and then by the 20th century, they ran rampant across the island. By the time the whaling stations were opening around the turn of the 20th century, in the early, the early 1905, 1906, 1910, the whaling ships were adding more rats to the rats that the sealers had already accidentally brought. So there weren't any more rats. Um, there weren't rats originally, and now we're trying to rid South Georgia of the rats that were brought accidentally in the last 150 years. 
it's amazing how quickly rats will devastate an area of nesting birds, which are ground-dwelling birds. So, um, but we're on top of it. It's the one I, this, this map of yeah. South Georgia is the one that was on the slideshow, basically. But it's only this section that we have left to do that. The other two sections we've dated the last twice in the last four years. And we're monitoring this year to see what, if what we did last year works. But we've actually done all of this. And we just have one. Yeah. And it's a, a proven technique that, that makes it, that was developed by the New Zealanders. Um, used in New Zealand, Southern Antarctic, and other parts of New Zealand, Rat Island in Alaska. Um, and it's, there's an international um, committee that meets on a regular basis to look at the best possible techniques to get rid of rats. And not only in South Georgia, but other lot of the South Pacific Islands, other parts of the world, it's, uh, the rats are being removed. <laughs> so it's been a, a, it's a pretty successful project. So Believe me, nobody hates rats worse than I do. But, but I'm just wondering, when you bait them, you, are there not like raptors and things that, that eat the rats that could catch the poison? So the, the question was, when you're, when you're poisoning rats, yeah. is there collateral damage? Mm -hmm. um, there is always collateral damage when you employ a uh, technique such as um, putting poison out. Of course there is. Um, on South Georgia, we're incredibly fortunate that there are no native land mammals, so there's no land mammals to worry about. Um, most of the birds are seabirds, and seabirds don't look at little cereal pellets and think, ah, oh, food. Seabirds are looking for fish and krill and, and zooplankton and, and the such like. So then they're not actually looking um, at those cereal pellets for... So you've, you've, you're left with very few things to mitigate against uh, collateral damage for, which include um, skewers and gulls, because the skewers and gulls will eat that sort of stuff. So, um, and the way that's mitigated against is you do it right at the very, very end of the breeding season. The skewers and the gulls are used to leaving South Georgia after the birds have bred, because they know damn well that the place is covered in snow and ice all winter. The rats go underground, so they can't even find rats to eat. And so mostly those birds leave. And uh, you will kill a few of them, but for the ones that remain, you're giving them a massively greater food source. So next season, they'll be able to breed far more successfully than they did in the previous season. And it's actually, it's one of the few places in the world where it is relatively easy and straightforward. Other, rat, other, other islands infested by rats are much more difficult to do. And you have to be really careful about how you do them, as you do on South Georgia. And it's, it's something that's, that's constantly um, being thought about and monitored. And, and it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be done if the side effects were so great that the benefits outweighed, you know, it, it wouldn't happen. Thank you. Uh, any, any, anybody else? Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Can you pass this back? Oh, you fell down the hole there because I never saw it. <laughs> Just a really quick verification. You said 90% of the imper baby penguins do not live past two years? The, the question was, did I say 90%, 90% um, of emperor penguins don't live to a year old? It's actually a year old, and that is correct. 90%. 90%. So every adult emperor penguin has to successfully have a baby every 10 years. It's, um, it's, it's quite extraordinary um, to think that most of them don't survive. Yeah, they don't. Another question over here. What's the lifespan of, of an emperor penguin? What's the lifespan of an emperor penguin? The adults, emperor penguins, when they make it to adulthood, will typically last 20 years or more. So they're quite long-lived, despite enduring the Antarctic winters with winds of 150 miles an hour, temperatures of you know, negative 70, 80, 90 or whatever, and diving to 2,000 feet to get their food, and hiking a few score, 100 miles or whatever across the ice to go to fish and come back again to breed. And they, the males fast for 120 days while they incubate that egg. It's, you couldn't make this stuff up. 
<laughs> it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible um, to think that something's carved out a niche that involves breeding in the Antarctic winter, starving for 120 days, keeping back some food, keeping back some food to feed that chick when it gets out of the egg, and then waiting for mum to come back and going, I'm hungry, I'm leaving. Um, yeah, yeah. And then hoping that the sea ice doesn't break up because, you know, you've got your navigational abilities, but your navigational abilities are to get you back to point A. Well, if point A goes floating off on the ocean current, then um, the point of your existence, which was feeding baby, uh, goes out the window. So, yeah, they're seriously threatened by, by the breakup of ice. Well, if there's no more questions, folks, thank you.